Um, yeah, so this is based on joint work with a few people, um, with uh, Nicola Pencotti, who's in the audience today, uh, Earl Campbell and Fernando Brandao. Uh, Nico, Fernando, and I are based at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing, and Earl is based at River Lane. So the uh, topic of this talk is quantum algorithms for combinatorial optimization. Um, and in particular, we'll be looking at binary optimization problems, where the goal is to, given a cost function h, find a uh, bit string z star that minimizes the cost function at some value e star. So we'll be assuming here, for the purposes of this talk, that the optimal value, the optimal bit string z star is unique, and that we know the value e star ahead of time. But these assumptions can be dropped in sort of the full analysis, which you'd have to go to the paper to, to fully see. So how might we solve this problem uh, with a quantum computer? Of course, we can run Grover's algorithm on it, which gives an immediate quadratic speed up compared to exhaustive enumeration classically. Uh, the runtime of Grover's algorithm is 2 to the 0 0.5 times n, where n is the number of binary variables in the uh, that are input to the cost function. Here, the O star notation is um, representing that we've hidden poly n factors, uh, which kind of uh, come from evaluating this cost function h on certain inputs. So really, we only care about the exponentiality of the runtime in this talk. So this is a nice speed up, and it gives us hope that we might be able to solve combinatorial optimization problems faster on a quantum computer. But it's unlikely to alone yield a, an advantage large enough to be leveraged into something that's actually practical on a quantum computer. And this comes from a few uh, analyses, um, which you can see here referenced at the bottom, which have kind of um, looked at the actual clock speeds of uh, predicted quantum computers, taken into account the overheads from error correction, and noted that uh, Grover's algorithm is sort of inherently a serial algorithm, whereas uh, classical algorithms like exhaustive enumeration are amenable to uh, parallelization on classical high-performance computers. Um, so when you take into account all of these factors, you find that quantum computers are going to suffer a very large constant factor slowdown, which will kind of cancel out this asymptotic speed up for uh, actual relevant problem sizes. So the goal of this talk is to see if we can go further on the quantum side and give a quantum algorithm with a provable runtime that's better than Grover's algorithm. So in particular, we're looking for a uh, runtime that looks like 2 to the 0 0.5 minus c times n, where c is some constant that's independent of n. Importantly, we know that if we want to be able to accomplish this, we're going to have to exploit some uh, structure in the cost function h because uh, we know that Grover's algorithm is optimal in the black box setting. Um, this emphasizes how it's important that um, if we're going to find an algorithm that has a runtime like this, we need kind of the, uh, the, the way that we're leveraging the structure in the cost function to be something that's inherently quantum mechanical. Um, because if we're just using some sort of classical technique that applies equally well to the quantum algorithm and to classical algorithms, we can improve both, but we can't change the relative quadratic relationship between the two. So if we hope to ever give a super quadratic speed up, we're going to need to find some ingredient that achieves this, uh, this goal. So uh, before I state our actual algorithm, um, I want to warm up with the uh, adiabatic algorithm, which is a well-known approach for solving combinatorial optimization problems um, on a quantum computer. The idea behind the adiabatic algorithm is to define a path of Hamiltonians, h sub b, where b is a free parameter, where this path interpolates between um, a Hamiltonian, this x Hamiltonian, when b equals zero, which is just a transverse field, uh, a sum of poly x operators, and then when b is large, the second term dominates, which uh, contains the information about our cost function. So here we've taken the cost function h, which is just a diagonal matrix, and divided by e star in order to normalize it so that its minimum value is negative 1. Here's a cartoon of the spectrum of this Hamiltonian hb as a function of b, and you can see the adiabatic evolution is going to uh, pass from left to right. The idea is that if we go slowly along this evolution, then we can interpolate from the, the initial ground state, which is the plus state, and easy to prepare, to the final ground state, which is the bit string that optimizes our cost function. And this is guaranteed to work if we go sufficiently slowly. But if uh, you know, we go at some finite rate, uh, there's a chance that it will fail. And kind of the, the time that is, this takes famously is related to the 
minimum spectral gap encountered along the way. You can see here in the cartoon, the spectral gap can get uh, very small. And uh, additionally, it's sort of unknown exactly where they will occur. Um, it's hard to analyze them. And uh, in fact, uh, it's known that for combinatorial optimization, they can be exponentially or even super exponentially small. So this leads this algorithm to be interesting and potentially something that could give a super Grover speed up in some cases, but hard to analyze and hard to prove anything concrete. So our algorithm will kind of try to solve this problem with two main ingredients on top of the adiabatic picture. The first ingredient is that rather than put the cost function directly into the Hamiltonian, we're first going to apply a certain filter to the cost function and then put in the Hamiltonian. So it's still going to be a classical cost function, a diagonal operator, um, but we apply this piecewise linear function to it. And what is this doing? Uh, so th this, this function is parameterized by a, a parameter eta. You can think of it as just like 0 0.5 or something for the purposes of this talk. What it does is it preserves the low cost structure uh, the, 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 the structure of this cost landscape at the very deepest parts of the, of the, of the landscape. So the, the, the places near to the optimal solution will kind of have their structure preserved, but the places that, that have high costs are just going to be zeroed out. So it makes most of the cost values equal to zero, but preserves some of the structure. And uh, this is kind of necessary for a technical reason related to being able to control the spectrum of the, uh, of the interpolation, of this adiabatic interpolation. And then the second idea is uh, kind of what inspires the title of the talk, which is that rather than um, kind of evolve slowly through these regions where the spectral gap is small and hard to analyze, we're just going to go as close as we can to that region and then jump all the way to the end of the algorithm. So what do I mean by that? We can go back to this cartoon um, where uh, you can see that the algorithm is going to have two steps. A first step where it goes from the plus state to this intermediate state, psi b, which is the ground state and a, an intermediate point along the interpolation, but close enough to the beginning that the gap is still guaranteed to be large here. But then when we get there, we just jump straight from there all the way to the end and we try to find the uh, optimal state z star. How do we make this jump? Uh, we'll explain that on the next slide, but it's important to, uh, to note here that it, it doesn't sort of come for free. Right? This jump will only succeed with exponentially small probability. Um, and so we would have to repeat many times or do amplitude amplification to improve that probability. But it's okay because we're just trying to show a, a small speed up over Grover's algorithm so we can tolerate an exponentially large um, runtime as long as it's something that we can upper bound. So here I want to pause and note that both of these ideas uh, that go into our algorithm are kind of coming uh, originally from a previous analysis by Hastings in what he called the short path algorithm. In fact, this algorithm is very related and inspired by the short path algorithm, as well as the analysis that we do later for the algorithm. But there are some key differences. So in particular, where uh, we applied this filter to the second term, in Hastings' algorithm, he applied the filter to the first term. Um, and he also used a different filter function. And then secondly, rather than do a small jump and then a large jump, what Hastings did was a large jump first and then a small jump. So uh, we've kind of flipped around his ideas. And um, as a result, we're able to kind of extend some of the proofs and prove some more concrete things about our algorithm in comparison to what was proved about the short path algorithm. OK, so now that I've kind of explained it heuristically, I'd like to kind of really define uh, what the algorithm is doing. The input to the algorithm is the cost function h, or some description of it. Uh, the optimal value, which we assume that we've known, but again, this, is, this can be dropped with a more, um, a more careful analysis. So we assume we know the optimal value e star. And then we choose fixed constants eta, which goes into our filter, and b, which uh, weights the, the second term in the Hamiltonian. The procedure has three steps. We just prepare the plus state. We jump to this intermediate point, which we do by measuring this Hamiltonian, because remember, we want to find the ground state of this Hamiltonian. Um, we measure the Hamiltonian using phase estimation, which will project onto the eigenbasis. And then we do amplitude amplification, if we'd like, to boost the success probability that we've actually found the ground state. And then the, the thir in the third step, we'd like to do a similar jump. So we start in this intermediate state, and we'd like to get to this computational basis state. So we just make a computational basis measurement, and we amplitude amplify the outcome that the uh, outcome we get is equal to the optimal value, which we assume we've known. Um, so here, again, like we're doing Grover's algorithm, which is amplitude amplification sort of on top of this extra idea, which is this uh, small, small jump uh, uh, before the big jump. OK, what is the runtime of the algorithm? So to um, 
in order to prove that the algorithm works, we need to assume a condition kind of related to the fact that we've chosen the value of b that we've chosen leads to this gap being large, as I kind of illustrated in the, in the cartoon. We call this the large excited energy condition, which is just that the first excited energy should be larger than some amount that guarantees that there will be a gap. And assuming this condition, uh, we have a very straightforward expression for the runtime. There's two factors, a factor polynomial in n that's coming from phase estimation to inverse polynomial precision in order to resolve those eigen, uh, the, the ground state from the first excited state of this gapped Hamiltonian. And then a second term coming from the number of rounds of amplitude amplification from the two jump steps. The first step goes from the plus state to this intermediate state, psi b. So the number of rounds of amplitude amplification is inverse in the overlap of those two states. And the uh, number of rounds of amplitude amplification for the second jump is related to the inverse overlap of the intermediate state and the final state. So these two terms don't contribute equally. Uh, this first step is sort of very easy, and we can um, see in our numerics and analytically that it has only order one cost, uh, whereas the second step is sort of exponentially unlikely to occur. So you have to do a lot of amplitude amplification, and it has exponential costs, although slightly better than Grover's algorithm. OK, so what can we, what can we prove about this algorithm? Um, before I get into the proofs, yeah, I, I want to state uh, the high-level results, although in the paper we have kind of a more expansive uh, 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 survey of what we can prove um, and sort of some if-then cases that, that I kind of omit here because I'd like to be as concrete as possible. Um, so again, remember, since we have to uh, exploit some structure in the problem, we're going to have, we're gonna have to look at specific combinatorial optimization problems. So here we've given four examples. And we're going to put in the table the uh, coefficient in the exponent. So if the runtime is 2 to the a n, we're going to put a in the table. And remember that Grover has a equals 0 0.5. So uh, our algorithm can determine whether or not a three-set formula is fully satisfiable. And its runtime is 2 to the 0 0.499994 n. Um, so it, it is better than Grover's algorithm, as I had promised. Uh, but admittedly, it is only a little bit better. Um, but uh, Another caveat of this, actually, is that the best classical algorithm for 3SAT is much better than, uh, is much better than exhaustive enumeration and runs in time uh, 2 to the 0 0.39n. It basically exploits this structure of 3SAT in a different way. Um, so not only does this algorithm for this problem not give a uh, super quadratic speedup, but it doesn't give a speedup at all. Um, you get a similar situation for KSAT. Uh, where we can prove an advantage over Grover's algorithm, but there's also a, a good classical algorithm that's better than exhaustive enumeration, as well as for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, which is an Ising like model uh, for spin glasses, where we give a slight advantage over Grover's algorithm, but it doesn't even beat the best classical algorithm. Um, an exception to this is the K spin model, where uh, you generalize the SK model to a uh, higher degree uh, interaction where we can give a better than Grover algorithm, but the best algorithm known to us is still just exhaustive enumeration that's been proved. So this, as of now, gives a super quadratic speed up, although we sort of expect that a more careful analysis of this problem, which hasn't really garnered that much attention, might yield a, uh, a better than exhaustive enumeration classical algorithm as well. But here it's important to note that um, the reason we think this is interesting, despite these caveats, is that uh, the mechanism behind the speedup is somehow, it, it feels like it's in, uh, genuinely quantum. It's not obvious how one would give the same provable guarantees for a classical algorithm exploiting the same effect. Um, and so it provides a potential ingredient that could be combined with other ingredients to eventually go beyond quadratic. Um, for example, if it could be combined with the classical techniques that yield uh, these uh, better classical algorithms. We've also done some numerical work on our algorithm. So in particular, we can um, do exact diagonalization on small instance sizes. Here is an instance with 20 binary variables uh, where we plotted um, uh, the overlap associated with these two jumps. So in blue, you have the overlap for the first jump. And you can see that uh, the overlap with the plus state, it's near 1 for a very large region of B. So we can turn B on very large and not pay really anything in this first jump. We can still kind of succeed with very high probability. But meanwhile, as we increase b, we get um, a very large increase in the probability that the second jump succeeds, because you can note that the y-axis here is logarithmic. 
Um, so this is consistent with our theoretical picture. And it suggests that if we uh, go up to a specific value of b, so here we've chose b equals 0 0.7, so that we're like comfortably beneath this phase transition point, uh, then we uh, will be able to perform this algorithm and gain a speed up. On the right here, we've plotted uh, this uh, uh, if the, the, the runtime of the algorithm by uh, as a function of n for uh, various instance sizes, and we fit it to a, an exponential or a, a line on a log plot. Uh, our results here are consistent with a uh, runtime of 2 to the 0.43n, so considerably better than uh, what we could prove numerically. Um, but still probably not quite enough of a speed up to achieve an actual kind of difference making uh, speed up practically. Um, the kind of target that we'd like to shoot for if we want to kind of make a, a good practical difference as defined by these uh, more in-depth analyses is a quartic speed up. So we want this to be 0 0.25. And that would be that would be more exciting. Okay, so in the remaining time, I'd like to give a brief proof overview. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I won't have time to give too many details. But I will say that the uh, the proof has kind of two main uh, independent components. The first component is proving this large excited energy condition that guarantees that phase estimation will be able to resolve the two energy levels after the first jump. Um, here, uh, the tools that we need are uh, first an analysis of the specific cost function. We have to kind of analyze its spectral density, um, which can be proved in many cases, such as the, one, uh, the ones in the table that I showed. And secondly, we use the log Sobolev inequality, which is an idea that we got from Hastings' work on the short path algorithm, as well as some ideas from statistical mechanics to kind of finish this proof. Uh, the second ingredient that we need, of course, is that this runtime expression is actually better than Grover's algorithm by a factor uh, 2 to the cn uh, for some n independent uh, number c. Uh, so I'd like to give a couple slides of idea on, on this. Um, what we want to show, we want to show that this thing is upper bounded. How do we do that? Uh, a few steps. First, we just uh, kind of turn it around a little bit to get this uh, projector onto the ground state into the denominator. So. Uh, this pi is projecting onto the ground state, and it's sandwiched in between uh, the plus state and the optimal state z star. And now the, the next idea is to replace this exact ground state projector with an approximate ground state projector, which is a uh, tool that has also shown up in um, uh, other analyses, like finding the uh, or, or proving that there are area laws in local uh, local systems. Um, our approximate ground state projector is just going to be the Hamiltonian HB divided by its ground state energy uh, taken to the lth power. You can see that this is uh, an approximate ground state projector because uh, the ground state is actually has eigenvalue 1 for this um, operator, but any other eigenvalue will be like suppressed by uh, whatever it is to the lth power, so it'll be pretty small. Um, if we take L large enough, it will be a good enough approximation that it will not cause much error. And it also leads to a much easier analysis pathway. And that's because we can take this numerator, which is just a sum of two terms to the lth power, um, expand it as a sum of two to the l terms, uh, and note that each term has a positive contribution to the sum, thus allowing us to simply lower bound each term um, and sum over all the terms. However, to lower bound each term, we do have to invoke some structure in the cost function. So what structure do we exploit? Um, it comes from the locality of the cost function. So here's an example of a cost function, which is a sum of local terms. In fact, every term has the same locality. It has degree three. When this is the case, you can make a statement about what happens to the, aver to the energy on average when you, um, uh, when you flip a bit at random, right? Because each bit participates in only a small number of the clauses. Um, this is the structure that we end up exploiting to prove our claims. OK, so now I want to conclude with just a summary of what we've shown. Um, we showed a provable super Grover speedup based on a fundamentally quantum effect. Here I want to highlight it's a super Grover speedup. It does better than Grover's algorithm, but it's not a super quadratic speedup um, because when you compare it to the best classical algorithm, it doesn't do qu more than quadratically better, except in that one case I mentioned, which um, sort of hasn't been studied so much on the classical side. But this is important because it has the potential to produce a super quadratic speedup in the future if it can be combined with other um, other tools, uh, because it is this has this fundamentally quantum aspect, or at least it, it appears to have that uh, that aspect. Um, another takeaway is that the magnitude that we can prove is is pretty small, um, but the numerical results do uh, suggest that actually it could be much larger. Um, so yeah, we look forward to kind of analyzing uh, this further in the future, and um, yeah, uh, we thank you for your attention. 
I'll leave this slide up while I take any questions. Alexander for the really nice talk about the uh, interesting results. I'm sure there are some questions. Hi, thank you for the very exciting talk. I have a very s uh, simple question, which is, could you uh, put this result in the context of lower bounds, like the BBBV theorem and like um, other query lower bounds for, because Grover was sort of it's optimal in the query setting, so how does uh -huh. that relate to this finding? Uh, well, yeah, I can say that um, yeah, we know Grover's is op optimal in the query setting, but it's important here that we've specified a specific cost function, like the, uh, a specific three sat instance or a specific kind of Ising, uh, Ising model instance, because this sort of gets us out of the query model and allows us to exploit some structure. So for example, in this, um, in this example of this cost function here, it has the property that each term is only uh, three local, um, and we end up exploiting that heavily in our algorithm. Uh, if you just had kind of a random, completely random cost function, this algorithm would not work. And in fact, like you can see here in the runtime, it gets closer and closer to Grover's algorithm as you increase k, the locality. Um, and so as you make k very large, then there's no longer any speed up at all. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for a nice talk. Do you think your methods are generic enough to be able to start classifying these combinatorial problems along the lines of like which ones have structure that are easier to exploit by a quantum computer and which not? Like to sort of focus the field on like these are the problems we should be more specific um, looking into? Yeah, I guess that's a good question. I uh I don't know. I mean I think you know, these are the same kinds of problems that people attack classically. I mean, uh, so it's kind of hard to say that like, oh, we should focus on these problems because we can show a little speed up here. I guess I'll go back to the, the fact that what we're exploiting fundamentally is this locality in the uh, cost function, which is also what's exploited in the classical algorithms. But this particular formula for like the particular property that functions like this one, where every term has the exact same degree, have this exact property. And if you had any terms that didn't have this, the same degree, then this property would not hold. So our algorithm exploits that property. And I haven't seen any classical algorithms that like exploit this exact property. So I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe this is an example of uh, a specific kind of cost function that we have you know, a way of exploiting quantumly, but not classically. But I guess as a broader statement, I don't know if I have any specific comments uh, based on based on this work. Um, but yeah, it's the interesting to think about. Heuristics do this all the time. And there is some classification within that field already. So I wonder if something similar can be done on, on, on the quantum side. Like a classification in terms of like... Uh, Exploitability to some extent. Mm, OK. Yeah, it would be interesting. Hey. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, my question would be, because you're comparing to adiabatic quantum computation, what would actually those runtimes be? Like, how close is the gap? Basically, like, you, I guess um, you can also calculate effectively an exponentially large scaling with some prefactors? Or? Um, well, it's, it's hard to calculate. Uh, you could, I mean, you could do some small instance numerics, but actually people expect that it's... Yeah, I guess one one problem with the adiabatic analysis, even a numerical one, is that uh, if you look at like an adiabatic path, um, you're going to have these small gaps, but you you can't necessarily only look at the first one, right? So you might be able to kind of see an instance which has one avoided level crossing, and you find what the gap is, and you can determine what adi the adiabatic runtime would be. But people expect that at very large n, more of these phase trans more of these phase transitions will occur, and that these extra phase transitions that occur in this kind of um, more nasty side of the interpolation are, are really what causes the adiabatic algorithm to be exponential. And then also, unfortunately, that you don't really see these numerically until you make n like 100 or, um, or 200 or something like this, where uh, exact diagonalization is no longer possible. So I think it's like very unclear what the runtime would be for the adiabatic algorithm um, or how to answer that question. But uh, it is plausible that 
you know, maybe maybe it's better than Grover as well. Like that, I would believe that potentially. And maybe the other point, basically asking, like the the idea, I think, is somehow that Psi B already takes part of the phase transition without having to put in all the effort somehow, right? Yeah, so if yeah. You have, if you have multiple kind of close uh, gaps closing, um, wouldn't like I could potentially see that the phase transition, that is the second phase transition basically is a relevant one which has overlap with set star, while the first one, phi b, would just then also kind of go somewhere else. Like, don't you have a similar problem that if you have many closings, the first trial state might be really bad still? Um, well, I guess like, yeah, I mean, I guess the idea is like we can prove that we can, we can prove that this first transition doesn't happen until like a pretty fairly large value of B, at least for our Hamiltonian. Uh, and we can also prove that we can go up to the very close to that point and gain this super Grover advantage. Um, so we, we don't really need to go further. I mean, you could imagine more convoluted paths where you kind of try to jump from here to here to here to here and then to the end. But it just becomes hard to analyze because you don't know where these other gap close, closures are going to occur. It was already sort of hard enough to kind of manage the location of this first one. Um, but these other ones are very different than the first one uh, because they're kind of going from one localized state to another rather than this extended state that looks like the plus state into a localized state. Thanks. Um, hi, yeah, thanks for the talk. I just have a question. Um, say, yeah. the, I don't know where the question person, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so you increase the um, probability of ending up at the ground state by boosting the probability. Is there any guarantee that this probability boost is enough to end at uh, the ground stage at the end of the algorithm? Yeah, yeah. So this is like what we are able to show. Uh, this this psi b uh, state is actually it's a ground state of a stochastic Hamiltonian, so it has like all positive coefficients, and then we can like just lower bound the overlap between this state and the end state. So we kind of have a very concrete lower bound on the probability of this jump succeeding, which we then amplify with amplitude amplification. Does that help? Okay. Okay, let's uh, thank Alexander again. <laughs>